Good afternoon. Time to get started. Today is Robot Day, something I know many of you have been looking forward to, so we're here to, to talk to you about that. The idea of robots, as, as many of you know, is, is not new to computer science. In fact, robots were on people's mind for many, you know, a couple of centuries even before computer science was even a, an idea of, of a science. One of the earliest examples I'm aware of was uh, in the, uh, around 1770, somebody built a machine called the Mechanical Turk, which was billed as a robot that would play chess. And it, it did very well, it played pretty good chess, and after, I don't know, I think it was more like a, perhaps a decade, it was finally exposed as a hoax, because inside the cabinet there was a human being playing chess. But that, even though it was a hoax, it stimulated interest in the question of whether it was possible to build a robot that would play chess. Uh, that question was finally answered about 200 la years later in the affirmative. The question of the subject of robots has also been a, a subject of great interest to science fiction writers. Perhaps one of the most prolific on this point was Isaac Asimov, who in 1950 published an article or a story called I, Robot, in which he proposed what have become the, the three laws of robotics. The, the laws that if they were adopted by the designers of robots would guarantee that robots do only good and could never harm humans. Well, here we are in the modern day, and, and as you know, there's a lot of interest in robotics all over the place. The, uh, the Navy, the Defense Department have invested heavily in artificial intelligence and robotic research, not only because they want to have more precise weapons and battle advantage, but they're also afraid that other countries might seize an advantage in the area and outperform us. So for this reason, there's a lot of research going on on this campus in, in the robotics area. Today we have Brian Bingham from the MAE, Mechanical and Aeronautics Engineering Department, to talk to you about robotics. And he's also director of Cruiser, who, which is uh, many of you have had interactions with. So please welcome Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Denning. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I think it's a, it's a great thing that we're doing here. Um, it's very timely. And uh, thank you all for being here. I think it's really, I'm amazed that we've been able to get this many people to give up their lunch hour day after day. And um, it's a real testament to, the, I think, the intellectual vitality and the things going on here at MPS. So um, as Professor Denning said, uh, my name is Brian Bingham. I'm a faculty member in MAE, but the reason I think I got tapped on the shoulder for this is I'm also the director of a program called Cruiser, um, the Consortium for Robotics, Unmanned Systems, Education, and Research here at MPS. And we're, um, we're the Secretary of the Navy's program in unmanned systems that's funded by ONR, and we support around 20 projects. Some of you may be working on those projects. I know one person is, uh, Brian there is working on projects that are, and you might not even know it, but it's supported by Cruiser, which is indirect funding from ONR. We do a lot of great things, which is a whole other 30-minute talk that I won't go into, but uh, if you're not a member, please join. So on to the um, topic that I'm supposed to talk about today. So uh, getting ready for this, a few months ago, Peter asked me to make sure that I said what I, what I mean by a robot, um, because robot can mean a lot of different things. And I mean specifically mobile things. So things that move around in the environment, things that fly around. So there's lots of remotely piloted aircraft. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about aircraft that can actually move by themselves um, without any interference from it or without any adaptation from the human. Um, Self-driving cars. This is a famous car uh, called Stanley um, that won the DARPA Urban Challenge a number of years ago. Um, humanoid robots like the Valkyrie system from NASA. Um, the Internet Star, the Robo Dogs made by Boston Dynamics up here in the yellow. Um, and then things closer to what uh, the folks in this room are interested in. So autonomous boats, robo boats, things that move on the surface. Uh, DARPA and ONR have a 130 foot version of this that was talked about last week quite a bit called Sea Hunter. 
Um, a number of folks here at NPS have worked with autonomous underwater vehicles or unmanned underwater vehicles that do mine, uh, mine countermeasures, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, our terrain robots. So a lot of folks um, in the Marine Corps are interested in how can uh, terrain, um, auto, uh, unmanned, unmanned systems in terrain help them do their jobs. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm things, things that can fly, drive, swim, grasp. So that's what I kind of mean by a robot. And the way that from an engineering perspective, we often think about these things is the, the most concise definition is, uh, I like the fact that in the first few lectures in this series, we were talking about the history of AI. And a lot of that goes back to the AI lab at MIT in the 80s and a guy named Rod Brooks who gave us the Roomba along with some other people. Um, and so this definition by Michael Bradley, the intelligent connection of perception to action. So one way that as we engineer these systems, we analyze them, we take them apart, we think about sensing. So how does, how does a machine observe its environment? Then how does it do some perception? You all have seen lots of that in the computer vision side of things in this, in this lecture series. How can, we, how can we perceive the environment? How can we make some decisions and uh, take on some tasks? How can we plan to accomplish those tasks? Doing some low-level control, things like uh, uh, motor control, servo control, and then pushing that out through actuation into the real world, right? So there's a lot of ways to decompose this kind of system, but this is one way that I think is a fairly simple way to think about what a robotic system, what most robotic systems do. Um, and I'm not gonna spend too much time sort of introspecting on what a robot is or what they do. I'm sort of more just kind of setting the stage for what I mean when I'm talking about robots. Um, robots have been widely, uh, been very successful in the last 40, 50 years. Um, in closed environments, like industri industrial environments like factories. So up in the upper left-hand corner, you see an auto manufacturing plant where you've got robots operating in a very, uh, very structured environment. They're doing repeated skills. This kind of boils down to the classic things are the, the four Ds of robotics. So things that are dull, things that are dirty, things that are dangerous, and things that are dear. They kind of threw the deer in there to keep the alliteration going, but deer means costly, things that we can save some money on. So, so things that are repetitive are a great thing to automate through robotic systems. Um, over here in the upper right, we see, uh, um, I think I read in getting ready for this, Amazon currently has 100,000 robots operating it in its fulfillment services. So augmenting, so again, things that are repetitive that, man, it would be really nice if we didn't have to do this. You can have this little orange robotic platform here, bring parts to you, you put them in a box, and a day and a half later, we get them on our doorstep. Um, again, kind of make, so thinking about more some of the success stories that we've seen in the defense industry. So if any METOX are in the, any METOX? Yeah, so you guys know what this is. This is a web, uh, web research underwater glider. There's hundreds of these at any one time acting like weather satellites for the ocean. Um, they're a really interesting technology. They operate for months, if not years at a time. We operate them for weeks or months. Um, and continuously telemetering data back. So pretty interesting autonomous system. And this guy over here, so a UAV, in this case a UAV that's not remotely piloted. This is um, a, a good book on this is called the Army, the Army of None. Came out last year, Paul Cherie was writing about autonomous weapon systems. And this is kind of one of the edge cases we often talk about in those discussions. The Harpy system is an Israeli defense system that can do some autonomous targeting. You release it in an area of interest, It'll loiter in that area, and when it finds a particular RF signal, it will make its own autonomous decision to target that, which is kind of like gives us pause to what's going on. Um, the Russians have uh, the Kalishnikov drone, pretty famous name, does a similar thing. The Chinese have a drone that'll do the same thing. So, so, so these have all been, you know, really successful operations that involved that dangerous, dull, dirty, and dear kinds of things, right? Um, but there's a bunch of things that robots can't do. So uh, it's Monday afternoon. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I did laundry this weekend. Um, I have a 10-year-old who I am still trying to teach how to fold clothes. Um, his name is Milo. And I would never try to teach Milo how to fold clothes by giving him a bullet-pointed list of instructions. I would never try to explain to him exactly how to do that in words, even in pictures. What I would do is give, get in a pile of messy clothes, and I would show him how to fold a shirt. And I, would, and I would hope that he could imitate that and then he could generalize that so that he could learn that skill. 
This is another sort of famous example in robotics of being able to deal with hard, rigid bodies. We can do that all right, but when we start dealing with textiles and things that are have really hard to see and hard to figure out how they fold. So, and kids are usually, well, don't take Milo. He's terrible at it. But lots of kids are pretty good at it, right? They can learn to fold a, a shirt, and hopefully, once they learn how to fold one of my shirts at the top, they can figure out how to fold a short sleeve shirt, how to fold a long sleeve shirt, how to fold his mom's shirts that maybe have different shapes and sizes, how to fold his own shirts. I thought this was interesting. It had my same little icon for a robot. Um, so they generalize quite well. So the, the promise is instead of engineering these solutions for closed environments, can we have an analogous to the way a child learns? Can these robots learn by interacting directly with their environment rather than us engineering the solution, us programming a solution to them. Human beings are really good at doing this kind of thing, but really bad at telling someone else how to do it, so we gotta show them how to do it, right? Lots of skills that you'll see as we move through this. So what we'd really like is we'd like, you know, this is a picture of a laundromat. So you go to the laundromat, you have this messy dryer, and I'd really like it if I had a robot that after, a few, after I showed it how to do it, it could take that and, man, produce this really exquisite sort of folding, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be, that would be, especially for those of you who have to dress up on Thursday or on Tuesdays, right? You get the robot to do that. Be fantastic. So obviously one thing we could think about is, well, there's, you've heard about a lot of success stories in artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So there's been lots of successes in the last 15, 20 years in using deep learning and using reinforcement learning and using these highly parameterized networks um, to be able to um, do identification and characterization. And there's some commonalities here. So what if we could apply some of the advances from computer vision, from speech recognition, from uh, machine translation to our robots? So one of the key things is the data, right? So uh, ImageNet right now I think has about 14 million images that have been labeled by humans. 14 million images have been labeled by humans. Um, in 600,000, I think 600,000, no, 200,000 categories. Um, it's a little harder to get the data on speech recognition, a lot of that's proprietary, but certainly millions of phrases where we have the, the text of an utterance and we also have the audio so we know what truth is. I uh, was sort of surprised to find um, there's lots of multi-million size data sets out there for uh, machine translation, but there was a paper published last year that they purported to train a network on 40 billion English-Chinese sentence pairs. So being able to take huge amounts of data, and, what I'll, and as I'll show in some of these examples, this is a real problem when we're dealing with some of the applications that I showed you before. How are we going to generate 40 billion unmanned underwater vehicle dives in order to train our, train our system? And how are we gonna label that data? Who has the authority, who has even the ability to tell what we're looking for when we're looking for it or how the robot should act? In lots of these cases, we're trying to automate something that we can't even tell it how to do ourselves. So some of the key uh, sort of things I think you should ask yourself as your, as your news feed spits these things out about robotics and AI is where's the data coming from and who's labeling it, right? Because in order to apply these uh, innovations to this domain, we're gonna to have to have that data and it's gonna to have to be labeled, right? So that's um, sort of an interesting uh, part of how, to, how that we could think about doing this. And um, so uh, Professor Denning mentioned chess at the beginning. So there's been some great successes here, right? I think, uh, was it 97 that we, uh, that Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov in chess? Um, Three or three years ago, uh, Google DeepMind and the AlphaGo program beat one of the um, Korean uh, grandmasters in Go. You guys have probably seen these pictures in the last few weeks. There's no robot. So what we don't see, we see a human being actually executing the machine's commands. We don't see, and I'm not saying that it would be in, in any way impossible, but it's not trivial to have a system, have a robotic arm, have a robot that was sitting there and manipulating the pieces, doing that tight coupling between action and sensing, right? It's actually a pretty challenging problem, even in this kind of the, the, uh, the great, um, I guess, uh, regularity of a chessboard or a go board, right? Having, having a system that could grasp all of those stones and move them around is a risk that they were unwilling to take. So, so we're still not seeing some of these things, right? If it was trivial, they would have, uh, would have been a lot more powerful, I think, to see a robot do that as opposed to having, you know, this looks to those of, if we didn't know, if we didn't have Google DeepMind there, we would think it was two people playing Go, right? We wouldn't think it was a machine playing another human. But 
It's really just kind of a, a way to think about it. So um, what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk on is um, thinking about what I would sort of call mobile learning machines. So, and I think when you, as I've sort of looked into this, typically coming from my background from the engineering side, we have engineered these solutions. Another way to think about it is we've programmed these interactions between the action and the perception. We have programmed these systems to do, we've been able to um, state in a procedural way through programming techniques or through engineering techniques, control systems and whatnot, we've been able to do that. But can we use learning? So can we use all of these tools or some of these tools to have the system learn? And kind of taking some cues from the first week, by learn we mean a new, acquire a new capacity to action, be able to fold close, and taking the same sort of ordering process, a machine A is gonna be more powerful than B if A can learn a function that B cannot. So uh, going back to the first sort of definition, if you will. And um, if for no other reason than I'm uh, hoping that you'll remember it, I'll go back to that in a second, um, is sort of my ice cream model. So it's after lunch, ice cream sounds pretty good. So I think uh, that it, at least it's useful to compartmentalize systems that we're gonna talk about into at least two, maybe three categories. So scoops, so AI, machine learning is obviously vanilla, and robotics is obviously chocolate, right? Um, so where we have the AI and the machine learning sticking on top of the, of the robot. They aren't necessarily, all they do is touch physically, but they aren't mixed together. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that using some thesis work over in ECE. Um, and, I, and incidentally, and I'll kind of try to remind us of this, I think this is where a lot of the low-hanging fruit is. A lot of the things that we can do to leverage these innovations in convolutional neural networks, in, in deep learning, in reinforcement learning, rely on taking a piece of artificial intelligence and machine learning and marrying that to the capability of an engineered robotic system. Um, we can start to combine these things. In the interest of time, I won't talk too much about that, but we can have swirls. So if we go to the beach, it might be nice to have things that are swirled together, of chocolate and vanilla. And then if we mix them together, we could make a shake, keeping that alliteration going. So we could mix these things intimately together, and I'll show you some examples of this, is where really I think the leading edge on the research is, is where we start to consider robotic systems that learn by doing. Um, this is a graph, I apologize, the numbers on the axes are a little small, but um, this is the web of science is a great way to sort of see some trends in the research. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a search in looking at the category of robotics and citations, so the number of times somebody cited an article with the title in it of learning. And so about 10 years ago, we can see that this really started to take off. I don't think, I think it's a bit of a, uh, it's not quite true that it's, it's tapered off. This was 2019 data taken a couple months ago. So um, we've seen that this has really risen in the literature that a lot of people are thinking about how can I apply learning or machine learning to robotic systems. So, um, so to take my sort of first example of one way that we could do that is we could take, I mentioned machine learning um, techniques for computer vision. And we could put that on top of a robotic system. Was there, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, we, could, we could put that on top of a robotic system. We could have our system respond to natural um, language. We could install on it the way, you know, we could use some machine language, natural, uh, or machine learning natural language processing to have our robot do that. And it doesn't have to know anything about the fact that it's on a robot. It could be on a robot or it could be sitting on our kitchen counter. And so, one, uh, one general category as an example is what I would call automatic target recognition. Sort of a, sort of a bit of a militaristic uh, defense, defense related way to say it, but if we take all of that machine vision or some of that machine, computer vision from machine learning to be able to classify and detect images and we put that onto a robot, what could we possibly do? And so, <clears throat> So I'm gonna kinda, as an example, use a uh, Lieutenant Ashley McGee, who works for uh, um, Xiaoping Yun, is doing her thesis with Xiaoping Yun and James Kalustian over in ECE. So she was interested in looking at this. If I could couple these two things together, but in a really um, independent way. And so it turns out, so in GCs, a lot of our students learn how to use MATLAB. MATLAB is, is, is on board with all the hype of everybody else, and they have a thing called AlexNet, which is a deep network, a convolution neural network trained on ImageNet. And um, so this is kind of from their promotional, promotional uh, material. And so she's been able to improve that network to look at targets she's interested in, and then couple that with 
in contrast to a learned robotic system, an engineered robotic system, a classic robotic system of being able to wander the halls. So this picture on the top is a, a pioneer robot with literally a, a camera and the perception si system sitting on top, uh, our scoop of vanilla ice cream. And she trained it to find orange buckets. So anything that's an orange bucket or an orange cone, it would find those things. Um, by finding those things, it would, it would report to the robot that it had observed and classified with a certain probability an orange bucket in the scene. And what her advisor challenged her to do was not to look for orange buckets, that's a little bit too easy, but to look for, if you, if you squint, you, if you, everybody takes class over in Spanagol, these are the elevators over in Spanagol on the fifth floor. So the challenge is go from the lab, wander around the corridors, and when you find, when the machine learning algorithm tells you that you've found the elevators, stop. So the machine learning doesn't know anything. She didn't tell it when she was training it that you're gonna go live on a robot. She just trained it to look for the elevator doors. And I think I have to go over here to play the video. And she's getting ready to graduate this quarter, so of course now it works. So, um, so the, it uses an engineered, a programmed solution to wander around so it can explore its environment. And then all it does is the machine learning, which is a payload on this robot, says, oh, I found the elevator in the upper left-hand corner, and it stops. But this is a really powerful thing if we think about, all right, well, maybe we're not interested in orange buckets and elevators, but sort of more, um, if we generalize that to more sort of uh, applied targets, right? So ground vehicles, right? So this is just a picture to kind of show that. You could imagine that the, the network, if it was looking for, if it was, if it was uh, applied to a ground robotic vehicle or an aerial vehicle, and it was looking for targets that it knew. Um, and then sort of a, an application that's near and dear to my heart um, for doing EOD type things where you're trying to do mine countermeasures. For a long time, for 25 years, the underwater unmanned system business has been really funded by the Navy trying to get sailors out of the minefield. And so this is a picture of a side scan sonar that's done some automatic characterization of the targets it found in that sonar. So over the last 25 years, our robots have gotten a lot better, our sensors have gotten a lot better, and consequently, we've slowed down. Because, maybe not right now, but two years ago, um, what we had to have happen was that robot could go out for 36 hours, it could collect terabytes of data, and for every hour in the water, it would take a sailor two hours to comb through the data by hand and identify the mine-like objects. So now you're talking 36 plus 72. You're talking about, um, what is the day and a three? Four days turnaround time. But with machine learning, we might be able to, and this problem's been around for, ONR's been throwing money at this for a long time. Can we use machine learning? Again, we need to find the data. There's not a lot of this kind of data that you can aggregate together, classification and all that. But could we apply, and in fact we can, apply that same thing to being able to recognize mine-like objects on the seafloor and it doesn't need to know anything about the robot it's on. It's just along for the ride. And um, so I really think that that's a lot of, and if you look at, um, as your sort of Google news feed or whoever you get your news from on your phone, and it's popping up, you know, if you've, if you've taken this course, it probably already knows that you're interested in AI and robotics, so it's feeding you all those, the AI's feeding you those, uh, those news feeds. You know, I think a lot of them fall into this category of we're taking this sort of independent systems. We have a well-engineered robot and we have a learning system to do perception or to do some other part of that feedback loop and we put them together. So I'm gonna kind of skip over this one in the interest of time, um, but we can think about the middle ground where we start to have the, the machine learning, the learning component of our perception system or of our robotic system. It actually is customized for being on a robot. And we can kind of think about things like uh, adaptive sampling, there's some system identification um, where the machine learning can be applied in a more integrated fashion. But what I'm really, um, I think, most interested in for this talk is what I'm calling the shakes part of my ice cream model. And that's where we intimately integrate these things. And this is where I think there's both tremendous opportunity and a lot of uncertainty right now as to whether or not this is really gonna work. So, and you'll see um, some of the, and I'll kind of make allusion to some of the early parts of AI. Um, so can we have robots that actually uh, learn by doing? So kind of back to my folding clothes model, um, can we have robots that we can show them what to do and they can then iterate themselves and they can learn using data, right? And, it, and that's not gonna be appropriate for every scenario, right? But 
can we, can we do that and can that exceed our capability in certain domains to engineer, to program a system? Um, so, so I'll show you a few examples of that. Um, one of them, uh, both of them use um, a, a thing called reinforcement learning, which you probably talked about in this class, but, um, or in this lecture series. But the, the main idea is uh, obligatory couple of equations there. The main idea is that we need to find a policy, that's uh, our pi here, that creates some actions based on the state of the system. So, you know, if I'm standing here looking at all of you, that's the state of my system, my action is to continue to babble on, right? And so that is my policy. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to find the policy that maximizes this R is the key thing, the reward function. So my reward function, I don't know what my reward function is. I honestly, I don't know where, I don't know why I'm here, but uh, no, I didn't. Um, so I'm going to sum over all time that reward function, which is a function of the state and my actions. So it's a very simple kind of way. And what this is, it's doing incremental sequential planning. And um, so my little cartoon version of this stolen from the web is we have a little mouse. In, in our example, it's a robotic mouse um, in the lower right hand corner. And its reward function consists of electric shocks. That's a negative reward. Little drops of water. That's a small positive reward. And blocks of cheese, which are a large negative reward. And so we need to find a way to balance exploration. So this mouse doesn't know anything about being in a maze. All it knows about is shocks and water and cheese and doesn't have any map of the system. And so it needs to explore this space and be able to find over here that it, its reward goes down, find that its reward goes up. Um, so it needs to balance that exploration. And then we don't want it to get stuck in a local minimum. We don't, or a local maximum. We don't want it to just, every time we run the game, it just goes and finds that piece of water. It has to have some way of balancing that exploration so that it continues to explore its environment and creates a policy which will maximize its overall reward, which of course would require it to find the cheese. So this, this is a common thing in optimization in lots of algorithms is balancing exploration and exploitation. So how do I continue to learn, but then know when I've learned enough to actually ach achieve my mission? Right? And we can think about how humans do that all the time, right? Do I choose to, um, there's classic problems of, uh, um, let's see, it's, it's dated, so I can't, I, I wouldn't say hiring a secretary, I'd say hiring a, uh, a co-employee, right? And so I, if I was to hire an employee, how many times do I interview, and when do I stop interviewing and take my best candidate? How much do I explore versus exploit the knowledge I have? So this is, uh, from a couple of famous folks in Germany, Jens Kober and uh, Jan Peters. So, and this is actually 10 years old. And so what you can see is a, is a graduate assistant teaching this robot through, through imitation learning is our first step, teaches it how to do this, what's called the ball in the cup game, right? So Kandama was all the rage a few years ago where you would have a ball on a string and you'd be able to flip it up there. And what you notice is that after the imitation learning alone, the system still fails. And it takes it a number of trials, actually not that many trials, to be able to achieve getting that ball in the cup. So and again, this is about 10 years ago. So we got close. And one of the key things is in creating that reward function, so we've, we've kind of said that implicit in this is that we've, substituting, we've substituted engineering this system writing a algorithm for doing this, which is really hard. In fact, I think I, uh, um, Jan Peters did a TEDx talk, and he said he had his brightest graduate student work for six months trying to write an algorithm to do that, trying to write software to do that, and it failed. But after 100 trials, the robot was able to do that, but not out of the gate. You know, don't think that this is in any way a silver bullet for this problem. What was kind of interesting about, um, about the way they had to do this was engineering that reward function. So engineering that reward function that told it, let's skip, that told it not only, you couldn't just say I want the ball in the cup. You have to tell it because then it turns out the robot will try to just pull the, pull the ball straight up into the cup because that's pretty close. So you have, to, you have to tell it, you have to in, actually customize and it's really still, much, still very much an art of what they call reward shaping. So you have to, you know, it's kind of like being a parent of a child. You have to shape the rewards so that this thing can learn appropriately because there's all these unintended consequences that highlight themselves when we don't shape that reward function. And there's lots of research on how we can do this without the brittleness of that reward function. 
so that was 10 years ago. And, um, and I, you know, and I, I um, come back to uh, Professor Denning had an anecdote from visiting the AI lab, I think when you were interviewing for jobs, about having a robot arm that could, they were very proud of a robot arm that could pick up white and black blocks. Could they stack them? Could it, put, it could stack them up. But that's all it could do. That robot couldn't pick up dice. It couldn't pick up, uh, couldn't pick up things with five sides, right? It couldn't pick up orange blocks, probably. So and this is the same thing. It's learned how to do a very specific, but it can't generalize that skill. Um, you know, you give it the, the ball in the cup game, but it can't play ping pong. Actually, those folks taught a robot to play ping pong, which is also an interesting YouTube video. So, um, so what comes next? So I mentioned the fact that, so in that, in that case, we started with imitation learning. So the graduate student gave the robot a pretty darn good initial guess at its policy. It knew generally what to do, kind of what that motion was, and then it iterated from there using some um, policy search methods to be able to find a policy that would allow it to get the ball in the cup every time. What if we subtract that imitation learning and we have the robot know absolutely nothing? So the robot knows nothing about physics, it knows nothing about, all it knows is that it has an image consisting of pixels, so it's operating purely in pixel space, and it needs to move all of these objects, all these sort of malformed, strangely colored, some of them are hard, some of them are soft, objects from one bin to the other bin. And it's a very sort of simple setup in the fact that it doesn't have a lot of instrumentation. We don't have a LIDAR looking down showing us where every object is. Um, we just have a single camera, or the, the researchers here, um, Sergey Levine and his and, uh, team out of uh, Google Brain, so it has a single image, an over-the-shoulder point of view, a, a manipulator arm, and a simple two-finger gripper. And how do, we, how do we create the training data to allow this system to learn? And a phrase that I really like is that uh, this, oh. uh -oh. there it is. Oh. is the arm farm. So we created an ar a farm of, you know, and this, last, this experiment lasted for two months. So six, six to 14 arms. I assume they were breaking and being fixed all the time. A team of engineers to, to help them keep online. And, and they reported 800,000 attempts at grasping. But that's from when they got the system set up, right? So 800,000 attempts over two months, and they were able to achieve 80% success rate, which, you know, if you... Um, if you read the papers and look at it, it's not just about this. It's, it's, this is using it as a surrogate for lots of more complicated missions, but I think the numbers are important. I mean, it takes, if we look at, this is a very small data set compared to ImageNet, 14 million versus a little less than a million, but it still took a significant amount of time, and we've parallelized it by somewhere between 6 and 14 robots, and it's a pretty closed system, right? This happens pretty fast. Again, think about doing, you know, 800,000 sorties of a UAV in order for it to train, in order, and, and 700, 900, 99,000 of those, it crashes. And that's how it learns. Probably not an appropriate use of learning technology, but we're, you're, you know, so I think the point here is that um, we're still not too far ahead of that step where we're, have, we're picking up white and black box, boxes, right? So, uh, so all of you who are afraid Terminator's coming, you know, we're okay. Um, so what they did is they trained a convolution neural network that was very customized for this particular case. Um, the interesting part is it works purely with pixels. It knows nothing about objects. It knows nothing about rigid body physics. All it knows is pixels. And it would predict, based on a, based on a maneuver, how the, the probability of success. So convolution neural networks plus reinforcement learning to be able to find the optimum, um, the optimum solution to be able to give you the highest probability of success. And then, um, I have to fast forward through this because it's kind of long, but uh, so, and then at the end of the day, uh, we can see that it does a pretty good job, 80% success rate. You'll see that lots of times it picks up multiple objects. Sometimes it picks up no objects. Um, and, in, uh, and then actually in some of the subsequent work, they came up with a more efficient, so it only took them 600,000 uh, 600, trials to be able to do it with much higher success rate, um, what they called QT opt. Uh, another algorithm for doing this kind of training, but you know this is really this is really kind of where we're at, and it's pretty it's actually both simultaneously pretty amazing 
like when I read it from my standpoint of looking at you know this research that this guy is a superstar in the academic community, the research is doing is it's, it's amazing, it's really cool. But then if I look at it from the operator perspective, I'm like, well, wait a minute, that's not too much better than white and black boxes. But but it is pretty neat that they're learning purely from in images. So so there's I think uh, also from the research perspective, it means that. Uh, Hopefully my reward function can stay intact for a while. I can continue to work on this kind of thing. All right. So um, kind of to, to begin to neck this down. So you know, I, I think that there's um, some real challenges to being able to do this learning in robotics. And a lot of that comes down to those two questions I showed at the beginning. If we're going to make the analogy to computer vision, to natural language processing, to tra machine translation, where are we going to get the data? And so I would encourage you as you're thinking about this from your operational perspective, where do we have lots of data sitting around latent? You know, where could we find that kind of data to train a robot? And by the way, data looks kind of different in this way because I'm going to kind of jump around here. So the data sets um, don't generally generalize, don't, don't typically generalize. So a lot of the self-driving car companies have been um, open, opening their data sets. And there's, that's really wonderful from, uh, from, from one perspective, but from the others, we're not interacting with the environment. One thing that's really hard about doing learning with robotics in terms of training data is that our actions influence the data. That based on, you know, based on where I move around on the stage, the data that I see changes. Based on what uh, tasking uh, a robot has, the data that it perceives is going to change. So having sort of static data sets to be able to mine is, you know, has not yet been solved. So being able to, um, one way that people have done it is with simulation. So, and simulation um, can be a great way to do the initial training. So you have your robotic system living in a simulator. You train it up with this convolution neural network and um, reinforcement learning. Then you strip off a few layers and you put it in the real world and it can learn quite quickly. But one of the things that um, has been shown kind of analogous to the way that we can trick computer vision AI algorithms, is that it turns out that what they oftentimes learn is they learn where are the tricks in the simulator. Where is this, they, they exploit the parts of the simulator that aren't quite right. And you get sort of very non-physical solutions lots of times. And, but at the end of the day, your solution's only gonna be as good as your simulator. So you're back to the engineering problem of how do I engineer a simulator that models, work, models the real world? And um, I don't think I have anybody, oh, uh, sorry, Dylan, I'm going to say it again. All models are wrong, but some are useful, is a famous quote from statistics. Um, so, and the reward shaping, as I mentioned with the ball in the cup problem, becomes a really pernicious problem, is being able to, so we kind of said that we'd like to get away from having to articulate how to fold clothes in a procedural programmatic way by having learning. Well, that doesn't really do us any good if the reward shaping is just as hard to articulate. And sort of I said this is like, do what I do, not what I say, right? I don't want to have to tell you everything about your reward function for you to be able to learn. I want you to just be able to naturally do that. Um, and then all the way at the top, you know, it kind of goes along with the data is exploration and, uh, and gaining experience in these domains, especially when we think about these systems applied to defense related things. Um, you know, I've kind of been thinking about this. It's like, where, where can we acquire that data? Where can we explore our learning space with little consequence and with little cost, because lots of these systems are gonna be very, very costly to acquire that data, and then it may not generalize. Um, and then, you know, this is not really specific to learning, but in, in robotics, we have to deal with things that are highly dimensional, that are continuous variables as opposed to discrete. And as I mentioned, the, the policy here says that based on my state of the world, I'm gonna choose an action. Well. We never really know truth about our state unless we're in simulation, so um, observability in state becomes a problem. And uh, my last sort of uh, points to summarize the whole thing is um, I think learning can be an important complement, but uh, <clears throat> I, I, I've seen, I, I'll say it this way, um, a colleague and I were at a conference about a month ago and there was a paper on learning to do station keeping for an unmanned underwater vehicle. Turns out, like, we know how to do that pretty darn well, and, you know, we can engineer a solution that'll work out of the box, and we don't need to deploy the vehicle 600,000 times in order for it to learn how to do that. So it can complement, and we need to be educated enough, I think a bar large part about this um, lecture series is to know some of, the, some, of the devils in, some of the devils that lie in the details 
of when we should apply engineering programming solutions and when really learning is something that we can use. Um, I do think that there's a ton of, especially as we move towards more applied things, low hanging fruit involving my scoops analogy of taking AI, machine learning, um, and putting that on top of a robot. You know, man, you could, you could raise a ton of money two hours north of here if you can have a robot that is uh, AI enabled, right? Or at least you could a couple years ago. It's getting, it's getting a little more busy up there. But, you know, like if you wanted to have a, a robotic system that's a purely engineered robotic system that's going to, you know, hear a lot about the sort of robotic wingman or, you know, every, um, what was it, uh, um, quads and squads was the Marine Corps. We're going to have robots that are going to be really working with working tightly with humans. If we want them to respond to our voice commands or gestures, that doesn't that technology doesn't need to know it's on a robot per se. We can just add that to our toolkit of robotics. Um, I do think the kind of last two examples I talked about. If we really think about our shakes model, or if you're from Rhode Island, fraps, where we're mixing things. Not even a giggle. Wow. Um, so. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, if we try to mix these things together, there's some real unique challenges about where do we find the data, how do we label it, and um, I think it's you know I think it's an open question you know the um, what was the what was the Game of Thrones like you guys have said this winter is coming, right? Um, so the next AI winter will probably come at some point, and hopefully we'll get a little farther down this robotics road before that happens.